Ancestry, part of a British Life and Culture Lecture Series by Dr. Kim Sturgis, uh, first written and delivered in 2011. Ancestry is the big backstory. It's the backstory of identity. It is backstory of who you are. It is part of the universal concept of self. And when I say concept of self, I don't mean the, uh, the, type, the, the identity we used to have when we were a uh, blacksmith or a miller or a uh, miner. Uh, I'm talking about the modern concept of a person's identity. Who is John Smith and what do we know about him? Along with people, nations also create a backstory. It's an origin of nations story. It's where we came from. And language is uh, often part of that backstory. It's the fuzzy story, the warm, uh, reassuring story that we have a great heritage and that we come from honest uh, quality stock. When considering a nation's origin story, we have to be careful. Scholars must avoid backdating a modern state into the past history. What do I mean by this? If we were to talk about 16th century Italy, we have to be careful and understand the fact that the modern state of Italy was not established until 1861. So five centuries ago, we should really be talking about the city-states and the, uh, the duchies that made up the, the physical land peninsula of Italy. Germany, we need to remember, was not established as a single entity a named entity until 1871. So everything that occurred in that area before, we should more correctly identify with the various uh, regions and the various dukedoms uh, that existed. We have the invention of tradition. And tradition is something we uh, instinctively feel has always been there. But the reality is, tradition is something that has uh, been formed, it's been created. Part of uh, tradition is often this concept of a nation's purity. The idea that there was once a time, a time uh, when we were innocent, we were clean, and we were unpolluted. And then as generations went on, our nation became solid with outside influences. These are myths. After religion, the concepts of ancestry and sometimes purity are the most common excuse for war. So we need to be very careful how we use the term and how we uh, identify with it. Pride in our ancestry is often linked to nationalism. And when I say nationalism, I am, of course, making a distinct difference between that and patriotism. Patriotism is when you are proud of your nation. You love it. Nationalism is when you think your nation is better than everyone else's. And you think that uh, you are superior. The other term which is thrown around and linked to these things is sometimes freedom. And freedom, unfortunately, when played with alongside nationalism, uh, has dangerous consequences. There is an importance of the written language for recording our national origins. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, our identity and our nationhood is written within the language we most commonly speak. 
History of a language like English, the English language, is more to do with politics and culture than just linguistics. If we look before the year 40 AD, no written languages existed in the British Isles, and or none that we have ever discovered. All the languages and all the history uh, about these British Isles starts for us with the arrival of the Romans. And the Romans wrote of their conquest and what they found in their wonderful Lat land in, language of Latin. So we have the Romans and they arrive in Britannia, in what they call Britannia in 40 AD, around 40 AD. Now in the south of Britannia island, they decided to call it Albion. The far west of Albion, they called Cambria. And the very north of Britannia, they called Caledonia. To the far, far west, there was the island of Hibernia. And here's a useful little map from around uh, the, the, that Greek time. Now the history of the Britons is the history that is written for us by our conquerors. In 44 AD the Romans arrived in Albion. The Britons mostly ran towards them on the battlefield and they died. Other Britons ran to the north and to the west to escape the Romans. The Britons that were left fraternized over the decades and centuries. They intermarried and they bred and they assimilated or were assimilated. In around 450 AD, the Angles, Saxons and the Jutes arrive in Albion and they invade the land and the people. The Romano-Britons, and this is how we will now describe the, uh, the natives, they die on the battlefield. Others run to escape and they run to the north and they run to the west. Those who remain fraternize and over the decades and the centuries they intermarry, breed and assimilate and were assimilated. Here we have another map showing the uh, settlement of the West, West Saxons, South Saxons, East Saxons, East Angles, Mercians and Northumbrians. And another version of the same thing. In 650 AD, the Norsemen and the Danes, the so-called Vikings, arrived in Albion, but they also arrived in Caledonia and in Hibernia. The Romano, Britons, Anglo-Saxons and Jutes die on the battlefield. Others ran to the north and to the west. Those who remained fraternized, intermarried and bred, and assimilated or were assimilated. By the year 800 AD, about one third of Albion was officially known as Danelaw. Danelaw meaning that they spoke a type of Danish language, their law was Danish, their customs were Danish. Around 700 AD, the Gaels and the Scotti from Hibernia arrive in Caledonia. The Caledonian natives, the Pipti, largely died. The Gaels and the Scotti colonized Caledonia and they were the ones who created the first king of Alba. Caledonia becomes known as Scotia. In 1066, that important date for all school children, William, 
Duke of Normandy, a Norseman, an earlier Viking, arrives in Albion. Romano, Britons, Anglo-Saxon, Northmen and Danes die on the battlefield. Those who remain fraternised, intermarried and bred, and assimilate and were assimilated. So, from about the year 1000, and we'll tidy it up, we'll call it 1000, we start to recognise something as the something as England as a nation. It becomes identifiable from what went before. All that we have now, we can detect back to a starting point, and it, the starting point is around the 1000 AD. Also, we see and I can identify the nation of Wales, of Scotland, and the peoples of the island of Ireland. So, it is important for those who with, wish to identify yourself with some form of uh, identity, nationhood, and concepts of purity. Consider this. The people who now call themselves Irish were once Scotti. The people who now call themselves Scots were once Picti. The people who now call themselves Welsh were once Britons. The people who now call themselves English were once Britons, Romans, Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, and Normans. We can then move on to spoken accents, and uh, although uh, we all speak English in the uh, these islands, uh, there are some regional uh, and uh, national minor languages as well, but we all speak English. Uh, these spoken accents 